Anytime. Good evening. It is 5.30 p.m. and I now call to order the Grand Island Public Schools Board of Education meeting. This is the January 14th, 2021 meeting. Notice of this meeting has been advertised in the Grand Island Independent, which is the district's designated method of giving notice of these meetings. We want those in attendance to know that copies of the Open Meetings Act are available at the entrance to the boardroom. If anyone in attendance is interested in addressing our board, you are welcome to do so. We simply request that you complete the appropriate form and turn it in to us now so that you may be recognized during the public forum part of our meeting. These forms are also located by the entry doors of this room. Mrs. Simmons, will you please call the roll? Mrs. Hinkle? Present. Dr. Bros? Present. Mr. Mayfield has given notice prior to the meeting and his absence is noted. Mr. Brown? Present. Ms. Wolf? Yes. Mr. Barsonis? Present. Mrs. Gordemaker? Present. Mrs. Albers? Present. All right, thank you. And Mr. Barsonis, will you please read the mission statement for us? Sure can, thank you. And let me just pull it up. Alrighty, and I would be running here on some issues. My web screen is not updating. Here I thought I was ready to go. Give me just one second. I apologize, but I'm only having my screen so only show me the student commitments and every here we go. There we go. Thank you. Here it comes. Every student, every day of success, educating the students, we teach hearts as well as minds. Within the school district of Grand Island, every student will be taught to read, write, and communicate effectively solve problems, acquire and apply knowledge, and demonstrate mastery through performance to the best of the student's abilities. Every student will be treated with fairness and dignity. Every student will be honored for their unique qualities and backgrounds. Every student will experience a sense of belonging, contribution, and success. And every day will develop responsibility to show respect for others as well as oneself. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item four is the public forum, and I did not receive any forms. Is there anyone that wishes to address the board? Okay. We will move on to agenda five, which is the consent agenda. On there is 5.1, the minutes from the previous month's agenda. 5.2, claims as submitted. 5.3, staff adjustments as submitted. 5.4, treasurer's report as submitted. 5.5 are the policies including 5.1, which is 6313 staff payments during closure, final read. 5.2, which is 8312 excessive absenteeism in final read. 5.3 is 6335 injury leave, final read. 5.4 is 4415 debt management, first read. 5.5 is 4416 financial investment management, first read. 5.6 is 4417 capital asset management first read. 5.7 is 4418 structurally balanced budget first read. 5.8 is 6252 professional boundaries between staff and students first read. 5.6 are the contracts, grants, and memorandums of understanding, including 6.1 the gear up MOU, 6.2 the UNL tutoring pilot for gear up and 6.3, the Heartland Health Center Behavior Health Contract. 5.7 are the change orders as documented. 7.1 is Stolly Park Elementary change order number four, final. And 5.8 is the agenda as submitted. Sorry. This is the consent agenda as published. Would anyone like to remove any items or add any items to the consent agenda? 
Does anyone have a potential conflict of interest on agenda item 5.2? If so, please state the check number that you'll be abstaining from voting on. No. Dr. Brose. I move that we approve the consent agenda as submitted. And is there a second? Second. Second, Ms. Wolf. Please vote. Oh, sorry, we're doing a roll call vote. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Mrs. Hinkle. Mrs. Hinkle? Yes. Dr. Brose? Yes. Mr. Mayfield is absent. Mr. Brown? Yes. Ms. Wolf? Yes. Mr. Barsonis? Yes. Mrs. Gordemaker? Yes. Mrs. Albers? All right, thank you. So we will now move on to six, which is the change of the board. And 6.1 is the adjournment of the 2020 Board of Education. Oops, sorry, is there a motion? Dr. Brose. I move that we adjourn the 2020 Board of Education and appoint Robin Dexter, Secretary of the Board as Acting Chairman to call the 2021 Board of Education to order and to preside during the election of the 2021 president of the Board of Education. And is there a second? Second. Second, Mr. Brown, sorry. <laughs> um, all those in, or so do the roll call again, sorry. <laughs> Mrs. Hinkle? Yes. Dr. Brose? Yes. Mr. Mayfield is absent. Mr. Brown? Yes. Ms. Wolf? Yes. Mr. Barsonis? Yes. Mrs. Gordemaker? Yes. Mrs. Albers? All right, and now we will move to the oath of office for the newly elected appointed board members. So if the newly elected and appointed board members would come take their seats, we will do the oath of office. And if you would please stand, and we will do the oath of office, and if you'll just repeat after me. Okay. School board members before taking office shall take and sign the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear. Okay. That I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Nebraska Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely and without mental reservations or for purpose or evasions. and that I will faithfully and impartially perform the duties of the Office of Member of the Board of Education of the School District of Grand Island. According to law, to the best of my ability, and I do further swear that I do not advocate nor am I a member of any political party or organization that advocates the overthrow of the government of the United States or this state by force or violence. And that during such time that I am in this position, 
I will not advocate nor become a member of any political party or organization that advocates the overthrow of the government of the United States or this state by force or violence. So help me God. Welcome to the board. Please sign the district copy and I will pick them up after the meeting. Thank you. And then we'll move on to the signing of the board operating principles. You each have those on your, at your desk. And the board operating principles is just a very impressive document that this board has worked on for several years now. And it really holds them accountable and it's always kind of our go back to when we have questions about the way we operate. So the following operating principles serve to guide individual board member interaction as we carry out the duties and responsibilities of board members, as well as to provide information to the public concerning the duties and responsibilities of the Board of Education as a collective whole. And the operating principles include educational advocate, process for addressing the board on board issues, meeting format, strategic planning process, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation, board leadership, and finally, board of education collaboration. So in signing these, you agree to adhere to the operating principles. So please sign and also leave the signature page at your desk. The next document is policy on staff use of electronic communication devices and administrative guidelines for network use. All staff members must sign administrators, faculty, and staff agreement form before checking out district um, electronic communication devices. So if you will go to the back of this policy and please sign and leave the signature page at your seat. And then I will read the board member code of ethics. And this was also developed by um, the board um, as an ethics statement. So as a school board member, I will listen. I will respect the opinion of others. I will recognize the integrity of my predecessors and associates and the merit of their work. I will vote for a closed session of the board if the situa situation requires it. But I will consider secret sessions of board members unethical. I will recognize that to promise in advance of a meeting how I will vote on any proposition that is to be considered is to close my mind and agree not to think through other facts and points of view which may be presented in the meeting. I will expect in board meetings to spend more time on education programs and procedures than on business details. I will express my honest and most thoughtful opinions frankly in board meetings in an effort to have decisions made for the best interests of the children and the education program. I will insist that the members of the board participate fully in board action and recommendation that when special committees are appointed, they serve only in an investigative and advisory capacity. I will carefully consider petitions, resolutions, and complaints and will act in the best interest of the school district. That is the board member code of ethics. And now we will have the election of the board president. And so I will now entertain a motion for nominations for president of the Board of Education. Dr. Dexter, I would uh, nominate Bonnie Hinkle as our Board of Education president for 2021. We have a nomination. Any further nominations? As we have one nomination, the nominee, Mrs. Bonnie Hinkle, is elected by acclamation. Congratulations. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate the support 
for one more year. Um, I've told uh, the existing board members and, and other people that um, I've made the decision that the last two years of my term are here and I will not be running again. So this will be the last year that I also run for president because someone else needs to learn how to do it while I'm um, on my way out. So uh, we could have never expected what last year was going to be like, 2020. And I certainly hope 2021 is smooth sailing from here on out. So, all right, we'll move ahead to agenda item 6.7. I will convene the Board of Education for the 2021 school year. And for Dr. Dexter go, do we need to do a roll call? No, okay, we can keep moving. So the next item we have is 6.8, which is the election of Vice President of the Board of Education for 2021. And at this time, I will take nominations for the Vice President of the Board of Education. The interested parties made their intentions known um, following our policies um, in November. Uh, are there any nominations? Mr. Brown. I would like to nominate Dr. Dan Bros. All right, thank you. Any additional on? Erica? Mrs. Am I, Wolf, Ms. Am Wolf, I sorry. On? sorry. No, you're fine. I would like to nominate Lisa Albers. All right, thank you very much. So now everyone, um, including the Doom Board members, you'll have some sheets of paper. We only need one. You only need to fill out one because we do this by closed session. So um, indicate who you're voting for, Dr. Dan Bros or Mrs. Lisa Albers. Put them up here and Dr. Dexter will collect them and count them for us. I'm the only one who folded mine. Yeah, he did. And Lisa Albers wins by majority vote. The, the last thing are the committee assignments. Um, I, we will be working on those tomorrow. As normal, there are certain committees that are really popular and others that others don't want to be on. <laughs> so, so it'll be a little bit of a challenge. And I'll probably, tr I think what I'll do is send an email to each of you and let you know why we did what we did, just because there, it is going to be hard on some of them. Like some we have all nine want on the committee, where others there's one or two is also. And that's okay. That's how we are. So I pre I'll, I'll tell you, I appreciate in advance <laughs> um, every, everything all of you will do to step up to make, it, to make the committees happen. So really appreciate it. All right, so we'll move on to agenda item 7.1 is the campus highlights the Great Gator Student Acknowledgement System. Dr. Palmer. Good evening, everybody. Um, I think we've got a little theme going with our campus highlights. We know that uh, with the pandemic that that has really heightened our awareness of the importance of social emotional learning and taking care of ourselves and making sure that we're celebrating with our students. And so the theme I think with campus highlights was really um, sharing with you how our buildings have really taken that to heart and are elevating that with their staff and students. And so tonight I have two great examples. Um, one from Gate Skaters, 
and uh, Principal Mr. Joe Eckerman, and he's going to be sharing with you um, what they are working on at Gates to celebrate their students. Good evening, Grand Island Board of Education. I'm the new principal here at Gates Elementary, and I'm here with my instructional coach, Sarah Robinson. Uh, we are going to share with you guys our new student acknowledgement system here at Gates Elementary. So, um, just this year, we implemented a new student acknowledgement system using um, great theater tickets. And when we have students who are exhibiting safe, respectful, responsible behavior, then a staff member, parents, teachers, um, maintenance staff, anyone can give them a great gator ticket for exhibiting those behaviors. These great gators acknowledge appropriate behavior whenever student is displaying them, and it's going to increase their connectedness to school. The other thing that we're going to see with these great gators is we're going to see students displaying that behavior more frequently that's going to contribute to a positive learning environment. Yeah, and at the end of each month, what we do with these great gator tickets, all of these great gator all tickets, of these great gator tickets, is they get um, dumped into a, a bucket and we draw out three students' names per grade level and they get recognition from their class, from the school, and then they get to take a picture with Mr. Eckerman that then is posted on social media. And then we partnered with our PTA to really take great gators to the next level. So what our PTA did is at every one of those monthly drawings, the kids are getting recognized, but then at the trimester drawing, our PTA actually donated prizes that are really gonna motivate our students to be safe, respectful, and responsible day in and day out to earn as many of those great gators as they can. And so far this year, our staff has passed out almost 34,000 great gator tickets and that yep all of these that's actually the exact number is 33,808 so that's a lot of great gator tickets and obviously we're super proud of the amount that we have passed out to students over you know the first half of the school year but ultimately we're happy of the positive interactions this creates between students and teachers in the building. We've also used the great gators to kind of focus on different things that need to be focused on throughout the building. So we've taken great gators and we took our panorama data that showed that our students really needed to highlight and focus on peers respecting one another. So the teachers gave out a golden great gator ticket at the end of every day and then our PTA came through as always and gave us an additional prize uh, for that drawing at the end of the month. So we've used the great gators in conjunction with some of the things that we really want to focus in on here at Gates. Yeah, so thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit about our building and how we are creating a positive learning environment for all of our great gators. That is our, our Gates Gators, and I think Mr. Joe Ackerman wanted me to remind you that he is a school principal, not an actor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> although, <laughs> they get a little nervous about, you know, this is really, um, they're really stepping outside, trying some new things when they're doing the videos, and they want it, they want it to be informative, yet they really want the focus to be about the kids, and um, I think it's just really funny that they're willing to do that, so. So next, um, I'm going to share uh, from our Newell Knights, and this is Mr. Nate Balcom. He's going to share with us 
It's happening at Newell. Good evening, Grand Island Public Schools Board of Education, Dr. Grover, members of the audience, and people viewing from home on YouTube. My name is Mr. Balcom. I'm the principal at Newell Elementary School. And tonight for Campus Highlights, I would like to talk to you about the Knight's Way. The Knight's Way was developed by the school improvement team at Newell as a school-wide positive behavior support system. Its goals is to establish a consistent school-wide set of expectations of behavior, as well as to keep us all safe during the pandemic. It connects with our strategic plan, objectives three, five, and seven. Prior to the start of the school year, our staff came together as a whole to discuss behavioral expectations for students. During the first month of school, all teachers worked closely with their students to make sure they understood the expectations of be respectful, be responsible, and be safe. The Knight's Way. In September, we developed a token ticket system called Knight's Way Tickets, where all staff are able to recognize students for doing a nice job being respectful, responsible, and safe. These tickets are collected throughout the week and given to students by any staff member. Additionally, for larger celebrations, we offer Knight's Way positive office referrals for students going above and beyond the daily good. Something we did not anticipate when we were planning out the Knight's Way was how deeply personal the tickets would touch the students. We've spoken to many of them who keep them in their desks or in a special place at home, like Jacob pictured here. The little tickets, even though they're small, make a big difference. We love golden tickets! To date, our staff has handed out over 10,000 tickets, positively recognizing students, and that's just in the first semester this year. And the results are real. We've had a 72% reduction in suspensions this semester and a 76% reduction in overall office referrals. So Bruce, uh, tell me about why you got a ticket today. Um, I got it for picking up the balls. Where at? At recess. And why, is, why, did you, why did you get the ticket? What does that mean? It means that I've been doing the night's way. I've been responsible. Very good. Thank you so much for doing that, Bruce. A lot of the day-to-day -day work with the Knight's Way does revolve around tickets, but mostly it's a behavior support system where there are expectations in every area of the school for students to act and behave a certain way towards themselves and each other. Whether they're in the hallways walking or washing their hands, keeping their masks on, or a number of other things, the Knight's Way is the way at Newell. It's how we are all respectful, responsible, and safe. Our school leadership team, as well as our SECL team, closely monitors the weekly data to make sure that all students have been recognized for living the Knight's Way each week. We also target our game plan students, as well as different demographic groups. Other ways that we recognize the Knight's Way is through our morning announcements and through the saying and reciting of the Knight's Way pledge each morning during those morning announcements. It is a good reminder each morning, but more importantly, it allows our students to internalize and personalize the Knight's Way for each one of them. We get golden tickets for being respectful, responsible, and safe. The end of each week is very exciting as we draw tickets for a chance for students to shop in our Knight's Way Bazaar store. One name per grade level is chosen out and those names are celebrated over the PA system in the school. And then students are allowed to come down to the office and shop at our store for a little prize to celebrate their achievement. Thank you so much for the opportunity for us to share at tonight's meeting. If you have any questions, uh, please reach out. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. This is the way. Um, so I think you can see some common themes, you know, in some of the presentations, uh, a direct reflection of the work that Dr. Dexter has done with our positive supports framework and the implementation of that. And we know we're going to continue to get better and better as we learn more and more uh, as part of that process. Um, Mr. Balcom did want me to let you know they did have parent permission to show that little picture of the boy sharing his ticket. She actually shared it with him and said, you're welcome to use it. So that was pretty exciting that our parents are involved and they're excited about it as well. So thank you for your It's time. a good example of it doesn't take a lot to make a big difference, obviously. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, so. thank you. Thank you. 7.3 is the GISH attendance update. Mr. Gilbertson is joining us via Zoom, I believe. Maybe. 
did they disappear? And, um, I appreciate that. I need to share my screen, so I need permission to do that from someone this evening. Thumbs up, huh? Yep. Okay, so you should you. have it now, yes. All right, well, thank you again. Um, for the opportunity to speak to you tonight regarding uh, an attendance uh, update, maybe a call to action, if you will, uh, based on our discovery and uh, the month of November, primarily November, December, before Christmas break, we we did quite a bit of work on, on attendance. And so I want to update you. But uh, before I do that, I, I also want to tell you that I'm um, jointly presenting with a Grand Island Senior High student. Ms. Jade Roush Word is here, and it is my pleasure to not only work with her, um, but also co-present tonight. So, so I'm going to quickly go through my presentation and segue uh, to Jade's presentation, and she she will reintroduce herself and go over some uh, action research of her own, uh, which was is really a nice slice of the academy work, the, the academy structure here at the Academies of Grand Island Senior High. So again, uh, very much enjoyed working with uh, Jade over the last couple months. Um, I will start out um, by just giving you the facts. And these are, these are hard to talk about. Um, we currently, as of, uh, I think I ran the last numbers on the 12th of uh, January, um, 43.12% of our students are either labeled severe, chronic, or moderately chronic at Grand Island Senior High. And I thought it would be pertinent to show some data. I uh, worked with Pat Larson at the district to maybe mine this data. We've also worked with uh, Dr. Dahl, and that work will continue to, to so we can peel back and, and continue to ask more questions. We are, we are not done. Um, but this, this line graph really shows you uh, the best fit line of, of the trend moving upwards, um, starting with uh, the year 2015-16. Um, the Nebraska Department of Education actually started tracking chronic um, attendance here in 17-18. Uh, and NDE um, considers chronic both moderate and chronic. So um, when you when you think about that, it's it's 10 to 20 percent of the days missed. That's what they uh, deem as as chronic. Uh, that's an important point to make. But if you follow the line, you notice there's since 2016, 17, there's a three percent gain in uh, in absenteeism across the board with a dip. Interesting enough, um, the pandemic caused a dip. Uh, mainly because um, you know we did we tracked attendance uh, August through March, and it's interesting to me that you notice that that number of 36.1 percent. Uh, that's good news. Um, even though we didn't finish the year, we were doing something right with the implementation of the five upper academies. Uh, we feel that um, the the guest speakers, all the, the the continuum of experiences that we have students engaged in here at the Academies of Grand Island Senior High has really helped attendance. Although on the opposite side, you see uh, the, the current number that I shared this evening and a, a climb back up to that 3% gain. And certainly the pandemic um, has affected that. Um, you know, uh, we, we have had restrictions on what we can do. Um, that's no one's fault. It is what it is. Uh, Guest speakers are not allowed to come in. Some of the engaging experiences that students experienced last year uh, before March um, have uh, been placed on pause. They're gonna come back, right? And so we, we, we earn for those days of getting back to normalcy, uh, they will come back. Um, other things that, and we'll talk about these tonight based on our action research, um, we, uh, we put all those students that are moderate, 
chronic and chronic in a bowl and we've looked at them and we decided, you know, we need to survey them. So here's the action research. We did receive about 21% uh, response rate on that. A nice sample of students came back to us and we asked them questions. Uh, the number one and most interesting question we asked them is, you know, obviously what is the number one reason uh, that, that uh, you miss school? And if you look at that large uh, pie graph there, it's pretty, uh, Pretty shocking to know that our students are, are anxious and, and stressed out. That may not surprise you. Um, you know, the other, the other factors are um, the gray pie there, the 21% is, is other health issues. And so just to give you a sample, students would answer, you know, I had a doctor's appointment I missed, or I've been sick. They didn't say necessarily why. Um, and so that comes in as number two. And then, and then family obligations uh, in the orange, uh, tra some transportation, only 4%. You know, um, sometimes we think, yeah, if we had more buses and more transportation, that would get our kids to school. But that, they're telling us that's, that's not the reason. Um, the, the main reason is, is they are uh, anxious and stressed out. We're gonna hear from Jade, uh, who's really done some really good work to, to fine tune that and peel, peel back on those um, questions. Again, 41%. Here are some uh, uh, comments that, uh, real comments that were written in our, in our uh, survey, uh, personal issues that get in the way of schoolwork, uh, which makes me more anxious because I get behind. I also, I've gotten to the point where I feel so behind in a class that I can't catch up on the work. So I don't care about the class as much. So that's the old, I'm in a hole and I can't get out. I feel, I feel overwhelmed because I'm behind in school. Um, secondly, some subjects are hard for me and I don't like feeling dumb. I, I deal with anxiety. So I also, and also being around people gets me anxious. I'm afraid that I might not miss my, or may not pass my class rather. And then lastly, the environment is hard for me. I love GISH and I love the teachers and the learning styles, but being in crowds that big are a struggle for me. And I have problems with friends and feelings, feeling accepted and or wanted in school um, are just a sample. So what do we do about it? Um, we have to have a plan and, and over the Christmas break, uh, I met with our admin team. We met uh, one particular day, I think it was right after the blizzard and we, we peeled back on, you know, let's, let's get down to the basics here. Let's go back to zero and, and really define um, what we want to accomplish. We we're very sol solution focused here. We wanna, we have to do something. This is a chronic problem not only at uh, senior high, but I believe in our, our pre-K-12 learning community, um, some, some students uh, come to us with, with habits of uh, obviously of not attending. So we looked at our beliefs and values uh, very clearly um, and our um, guiding principles um, for our work as an as a admin team and as lead teachers uh, within our academy structure, our PLCs. And it's complicated. I mean, you, you can imagine by looking at the data and peeling back, um, there's not one answer that will, will fix this. Um, we, we feel like it's, it's multifaceted. Um, certainly anxiety um, jumps out at us, at us, stress and anxiety. So how do you alleviate that? Um, and certainly we have some things in our district that, that um, are helping uh, the panorama uh, data is helping us maybe peel back and look at triggers that cause anxiety and and uh, uh, stress for our students. Um, that's another data source that we can we can use utilize in our in our PL structure. And we're also working on equitable grading practice practices at a district level and in our teams. And we feel. Um, that we do need to revamp and relook at how we 
uh, report grades and and uh, grade students in, in the academy uh, environment um, to basically motivate students, you know, um, so they don't feel uh, that that they're in a hole and cannot get out like that one particular student had mentioned. Um, so the notion is really, how can we become less reactive and more proactive? So we, we really feel like we need to work on some tier one strategies, uh, keep that very, very simple in the, in, the, in the classroom. And some examples of that, we currently have our PLC teams, not all of them, these are, these are uh, strategies that we can implement across academies with fidelity. Um, and they are levers that could, can be measured. And so that first one, student team meetings, um, make a goal to have five student uh, team meetings a week. And what that looks like is it's a good old fashioned um, RTI meeting, but with the student in, in place, uh, present in the meeting, and um, it's very effective. Um, there's no doubt that rigor, relevance, and relationships matter. And so this, this first strategy is a, is a great way to build a relationship uh, within that small learning community. And so, for example, you have a student come in and you have three to four teachers uh, working with the student um, to set goals and to plan uh, their improvement, not only in school, but with their at uh, attendance in this example. Um, secondly, utilize the five to one strategy. You're probably familiar with that. So five positives to every one correction, five positive comments. The key word there is intentionality. It's easy to be aware of that strategy and then forget to use it. So we want to become uh, more intentional uh, in that regard. And then lastly, the two by 10 strategy with intentionality again. Two by 10 is, is you're spending two minutes per day for 10 days in a row uh, talking to an at-risk student uh, about anything she or he wants to talk about. And, that, and that's a a great way to, to um, provide a touch point for students and, and again, advocate, uh, mentor uh, students that, that are at risk. Um, we also um, feel it's time to reunite the attendance uh, district task force. Um, we, we did have that moving uh, in the right uh, right direction before the pandemic and and then the pandemic happened and so we sh sure would like to join hands with with the the district but also our, our pre-k 12 uh, cohorts and and look at attendance from a, a community standpoint so possibly bring in community partners and create a movement um, i did make the comment just a couple days ago i said just imagine if we put as much energy and um, communication efforts into attending school uh, as we've done uh, in, our, in our school, specifically wearing a mask, following the protocols and those kind of things. And so we really feel like we can create that movement. Other communities around us have done that. One example would be Jefferson, uh, or excuse me, Wrong city. Springfield, Missouri has done some really good work with in their school district with attendance as a community movement push. Here's just one example I pulled off their website. Um, they have a uh, attendance hotline um, so community members can can perform a citizen arrest, if you will, or call in a student that might be out there um, not attending um, and uh, they can do that during school hours as a way to be anonymous, but report a concern. That's just one example. That same district has what they call attendance advisors who are not counselors or social workers. Uh, they work um, solely on attendance. And so they, they go after uh, students that are not attending, um, support them, um, track data, et cetera. Um, you know, our ad team, admin team here at Senior High said it's not going to be one quick fix. It never is, right? The most important person in the classroom is the teacher, and that's the most compor um, important component in a school, in my opinion. And so, again, 
uh, we want to focus on instruction, uh, what we can what, what we can control in the classroom, and keep chipping away at at our efforts. Um, one other thing I just wanted to mention is you know we we have an amazing uh, alternative uh, options for students, uh, alternative ed, as you all know. And uh, for the Success Academy, for instance, is, is full. And we have a waiting list for a lot of these students with anxiety and stress. That's just one example of, on one hand, we celebrate that we have that facility. On the other, we're, we're saddened that sometimes we, we fill it up and uh, we don't have places for students who, who are on that tier, tier three, really needing some, some uh, support. Um, I will stop there because I'm out of time, and, and, but I will f field questions. I, I feel like after Jade shares her action research, um, then both of us could field questions for you if that's okay. So I'm gonna stop my share and I'm gonna ask Jade to step up and share her screen. All right, thank you, Gilbertson. Um, in case all you don't know, my name is Jade Roward, and I'm a sophomore at Grand Island Senior High. And uh, a while back, I had a project for counseling and mental health, um, and I decided to do it over student mental health. So I presented to the um, principals and the counselors, and the principals loved it. So here I am now. <laughs> and I'll do a screen share. And uh, I just want to say real quick in advance, my camera does not work. That's why uh, Gilbertson uh, can't see my face. I, it still doesn't work for Zoom. I'm not sure why. I was going to get it checked out at the uh, tech office, but then I got sick, so I never got the chance to. So I'm still quarantined at home. <clears throat> anyway, so this is my uh, presentation for student mental health. And I originally had a partner for it, but she couldn't join me on this presentation, sadly. All right, so the importance of good mental health. We all know, obviously, mental health is very important, especially in adolescents and children, teenagers, adults too. Um, but uh, last year, I did a specific essay about mental health for my English class, which is um, sourced below here. I have the link for it in case any of you want to look at it. Um, uh, it was about the effects on individuals and society, uh, how, how mental health affects people. And um, mental health ties to physical health and how the two uh, balance off of each other. So, um, uh, in my essay, I sourced articles uh, that were cited for evidence and I double checked them all. And then I gave my reasons as to why mental health is important. Like I said, if any of you want to uh, check that out. And then, like I said, uh, mental health is also especially very important in students as mental health can affect everything in your life from your school to your relationships with your family and your friends and to your sleep. Like I said, it has ties to physical health. So it's very important to maintain good mental health so you can uh, do well in school and succeed in life. Um, and there's a, especially a added stress factor on this generation of students. Uh, one thing I didn't really dig into much that I want to get to probably in the future was um, the effects of social media and internet access on this generation. Um, I noticed many people in this generation, like myself, st uh, struggle with mental illness or mental health issues. Um, the pandemic was especially hard on adults and teenagers and children alike. Um, so lots of factors in that. Uh, here's just a few articles that I sourced talking about mental health and how students are really stressed. Um, Edutopia at the top did an article on cortisol levels in students. Now, cortisol is a hormone in your body that's released when we're under stress or pressure. And it's okay during stressful events, but to be on, uh, to have lots of it in your system at all times is uh, very unhealthy for you. And it showed that um, through testing that when students experience an academic setback, such as a, um, a failed test or a bad grade or missing homework assignments or uh, late attendance, uh, they experience a increase in cortisol levels. Um, a New York Times article uh, 
did a survey on multiple students in multiple different states, asking them what they could fix about the American education system as a whole. And some of the common responses were to put less pressure on students, um, uh, eliminate standardized tests and de-emphasize the importance of grades. For like, for example, the uh, grade letters or the percentage that you get to de-emphasize how important that is versus the actual content that you're getting from class. Um, an APA article talked about, and this is more applies to college students, but it still applies to students uh, overall. They did a survey or on uh, students on a college campus and found that there was a large increase in students seeking help. Uh, a Harvard Medical article talked about more college stress and they did another survey and found that there was a great increase in suicidal thoughts or tendencies in uh, college students. There was also a great increase in stressful life events as um, transitioning from high school to college can be very stressful and you're starting to get like more out into the real world. So there's lots more stressful life events. And then they also noticed that these numbers were generally a lot higher in minority groups. Um, APA, they did another article talking about teen stress versus adult stress. And they found through uh, their own research that uh, cortisol or a stress level in teens match that of adults, which is not good because teens brains are still developing and we're still trying to figure ourselves out. So it's, it's very bad to have uh, stress levels matching that of adults. And then an NPR article talked about school stress effects on health. And it showed through a survey that about 45% of teens said they were very stressed by school. All right, so a while back, I created a survey on Google Forms talking about students' mental health. And with the help of Ron Hester and Mr. Gilbertson, uh, I had it sent out to the entirety of GISH. Uh, students. And then uh, it was also sent out to two middle schools. It was sent out to Barr Middle School and uh, Walnut Middle School. So these next few slides are just going to be the results of the survey that I sent out. All right, the first question is just asking about your age, which found that a great majority is in the th uh, almost 50% is in the 13 to 15 year old age. So older middle schooler to young high schooler range. But keep in mind, there are older high schoolers like upperclassmen as well as younger middle schoolers, those are in the mix as well. Um, what school do you attend? A great majority, over 60% said they uh, attend Grand Island Cedar High. So do keep in mind that most of these responses are from high school students. However, almost 38% uh, are from middle school as well. So we do have middle school responses. Um, what is your gender? A great majority, like I said, another thing to keep in mind is that it's very, uh, the responses were very female dominated, almost 60% female responses. And then 36.5% uh, were, uh, were male responses. However, I noticed it was very interesting because I uh, gave a another option where you could type in what you wanted in case it, male or female didn't suit you. So I noticed there were actually some responses for non-binary or gender fluid, or some people put in their own responses, which made me very happy to see. And I found it very interesting because as I've said before, um, stress tends to be higher in uh, groups of minorities, uh, and that includes uh, LGBT people. All right, so the first question was asking on a scale of one to 10, how stressed would you say you are on a daily basis? And it showed that most responses, as you can see from the chart, are around a seven or eight, which is very unhealthy because it's okay to be stressed during a stressful time in your life or a stressful life event, or like say you have a big test coming up, but to be stressed at a one to 10 level seven or eight on every single day is very unhealthy, as I've mentioned before with the cortisol levels raising in your body. Um, how much of that stress is caused by school priorities or pressure? Uh, the highest responses at almost 20% said almost all of it is. And then another response at 19% said most of it is, which is pretty concerning. Um, uh, question three was actually split into multiple parts. So that's why it's uh, uh, labeled 3A. And this question was asking what exactly causes all your school related stress and choose all that apply. 
and a great majority at over 50% said that there was too much homework. And the next highest response is what was that there is not enough free time and other responses say, said things like there's too many tests or the teachers aren't helping me. And then there was lots of people that gave uh, their own responses to their life experiences. Um, next part of the question asked them to go in depth or in detail about what exactly causes all of the stress, not just school related stress. Um, so I gave them an answer or like an essay question that they could type as much as they wanted. And a great majority of people I saw said that there was way too much homework stressing them out. Uh, lots of people are stressed from deadlines, grades, and AT ACT score prep. Uh, a lot of people said that the education system is too focused on like the grade stats or the letter and like the homework amount rather than how much you're actually taking away from the class time. Um, most people don't have enough free time. Some people don't understand the content. Many, many people I've noticed, and this I'm guilty of this myself, have poor stress control or time managing skills and also have a problem with procrastination. Um, a lot of people I notice have learning disabilities or mental disorders. Um, many people have high expectations put on them from peers or especially from family members. And then it's a bit of a unique circumstance, but I feel we must add it because it is part of our daily lives now that the COVID situation, the pandemic and the online school was a great stress factor. Um, this below was an entry put in by a specific student and uh, it says anonymous because all the answers were anonymous. So I don't know who it was or what school they were from or how old they were. And it said, I have ADHD and dyscalculia, which is pretty much just dyslexia, but with numbers. Um, the school system's not friendly towards students with learning disabilities outside of the very small box of, I just won't pay attention and cause problems. I do try my best, but I physically cannot focus on something if I'm not interested. This isn't something I can change. However, GIPS see, uh, sees my grades and my ACT score and thinks that I'm doing just fine when the reality is that I have to cheat on most of my math tests to get anything higher than a 60. Um, this is just 3B continued because there was a lot of responses. Uh, many people have troubles at home or in school, like with family or friends, so relationship issues. Um, many, many people have trouble catching up after they fall behind. Um, as I've mentioned before, uh, there's a lot of people giving half effort as a result of too much, much work. So it's kind of that quality versus quantity. And currently, a lot of students feel like there is a quantity over quality mentality, which is not good. Uh, a lot of people have trouble with concentration. Many, many people, especially high schoolers, I've noticed, uh, don't get enough sleep or they're always tired. Some people said there's too many tests. And then lots of people just have other personal issues. Everyone does, especially teenagers. So that can make life hard sometimes. Um, some of the responses said, I wish I could have more free time outside of school and not have to worry about assignments. It sometimes gets to the point where I consider not doing assignments or even skipping a particularly stress inducing class altogether. I've never done these things and I likely never will, but I do think about it some days. Um, the main problem for my stress is that if I don't get my grade up, I have to retake ninth grade. Usually that would make you want to get it done, but for me, it just makes me freeze up. Um, it makes me have anxiety attacks and shut down. Like I said, Mr. Gilbertson earlier mentioned a lot of uh, the anxiety causing attendance issues. It, as it's shown, it's also been causing uh, grade or homework issues. Um, I become very anxious and stressed about many things. This stress can cause me to get physical symptoms such as hives, which is a callback to my essay that I mentioned earlier about how mental health and physical health are very closely related and have a very direct relationship. So if your mental health is bad, it's likely that your physical health is also going to be bad. And if your physical health is bad, it's likely that your mental health will be bad too. Um, question 4A asked, uh, would you say your school and its teachers do a good job of paying attention to and caring for students' mental health? Um, a great majority at almost 50% said, Sorta, of, they do a fine job of helping when I ask, which is not a bad response. It's a fairly neutral response, but it's still alarming that so many people think that because I don't think I mentioned it before, but my survey got a total of 636 responses, which definitely not near as, uh, as much as Gilbertson and his work has been getting, but still quite a lot. Um, so, and then one thing that I found very concerning was that almost 13% 
of responses said that not at all, I'm very stressed and they don't notice or do anything to help, which I would definitely 100% wanna lower that number if anything. Uh, question 4B asked, what if, if your teachers do well or if your school system does well at paying attention to your mental health, what exactly do they do well at? So looking at the positives first. Um, people said that uh, the teachers help when the student's confused or doesn't understand the material. Um, they ask if students need help if they see they have low grades. So the grades do help in certain cases. Um, some teachers give deadline extensions, but that's more particular to the um, specific teacher and their teaching style. Um, some spend extra time to help students coming in on their own time. For example, if you have to retake a test or if you need help on homework that you don't understand, you can come in before or after school and a teacher will be there to help you. Um, they understand, or at least some understand that students have other homework to do, not just one class. And then some teachers give students a break or talk through them with their problems. Uh, one response said, some teachers usually don't ask what's wrong, but they give you your space and some other teachers don't notice. So that's a fairly neutral response. And again, it's just more has to do with the individual person and the individual teacher and what they're like, um, not anything drastically wrong with the actual like system itself. But as I've mentioned before, individuals have, even if they're all completely different, looking at the larger picture, it still has a great effect on society as a whole. And it still has a great effect on whatever like larger unit um, as a whole. For example, it would be teachers as individuals and the school system as the whole, if that makes sense. So if you have a great majority of teachers not doing, doing their job well or not caring for students' mental health, even if you do have good teachers, which there are, and very thankful for that, it'll still have great effects on the uh, system overall. Um, if you're stressed with the subject that you're in, they will help you, but if you're stressed because of friends or family, they'll uh, send you to see a counselor, which is not bad, and I'm very, very grateful that we do have great resources uh, here at GIPS um, for mental health, like school, psych uh, school psychologists and counselors and social workers. I'm very grateful for that. But one thing I would really like to look at is improving the teachers and inside the classroom and maybe even the entire, like I said, uh, system as a whole. Um, <clears throat> this one uh, I put in teacher's name because I wanted to keep it anonymous. So that's why that says that. So it says this person always asks kids to rate how they feel from a one to 10. And if it's lower than a five, it means they're doing bad. So she leaves the classroom with them and talks to them about it. And if she sees you with your head down or sees you looking sad, she'll ask if you're okay. So again, more specific to the type of person the teacher is. Uh, question 4C asks, okay, if, if your teachers don't or your school system don't do a good job of paying attention to mental health, what could they do better? Um, a lot of people said to understand that students have a lot going on in their lives outside of school, um, look deeper into the problem and help them with it, uh, give students more free time, one uh, lady put in a response, it was a female student, and said that it was, it was like, a, again, it was very specific to the type of teacher it was. It's not a problem at all with the whole system or all teachers, but they said that there was a problem they had with their uh, teacher being ridiculed for asking questions or being confused, which is not, I don't, I don't wanna tolerate that. And I know neither, and none of you want to either, so. Nothing drastic with all teachers, but still something that I found upsetting was that some people are ridiculed for being asked or for asking questions or being confused. Um, notice when students are struggling because most are often too scared to ask for help or they don't know how, or sometimes they don't even know that they're struggling. Um, take some stress away from students who are too stressed or doing poorly or just even just having a bad day. And then more mental health check-ins. Uh, one response said, I know there's a lot of kids at the school and we do have a lot of counselors, but sometimes they're too busy to be there, which is what I said earlier about improving in the classroom. Um, I feel like teachers could be a little more understanding if we're having a rough day. I mean, don't always excuse bad behavior, but sometimes we're under a lot of pressure to do well and get things done. So sometimes we may, we may have an attitude. And then one response that made me very happy, uh, oh, well, it's covering it, but it said uh, checkups like these, which made me really happy to see because Again, this just started as a, a project that I wanted to get an A on for my uh, foundations class. And then it just suddenly took off and it made me very happy to see that 
students were noticing that, oh my gosh, they care. <laughs> They're reaching out to us. They're trying to make a difference. So it made me very happy to see that my survey and my work was actually taking off and making a difference. Uh, question five asked, do you regularly see some sort of mental health professional? And a very alarming statistic, as you can see, because only almost 16% said that they do and uh, almost 80, wait, 84% said that they don't, which doesn't line up with the other data because as you've been seeing, many, many students are struggling and are uh, most likely need some sort of mental health professional or a counselor or someone to get, the, to get them through their problems, but only 16% see someone for their problems, which is really alarming. Um, question six, six asked, how many hours of sleep do you generally get on a school night? And for this one, almost 41% said six to eight hours, which is not bad. Um, if anything, I think most uh, teenagers actually need about seven to eight hours of sleep. Um, and then there is about a split st uh, statistic between four to six hours, which is not good. And then eight to 10 hours, which is the recommended. So my goal is even though this is not a bad statistic to have, I would still like to raise this number and see it at a lot higher rate of the recommended hours of sleep. Uh, question 7a asked, what are you involved in that takes up time or makes you busy? And then choose all of that apply. Um, most people said that they have lots of homework or schoolwork. Some people have to take care of their family. A lot of people are in extracurriculars such as uh, band or orchestra or choir or a sport. Um, some people are members of organizations like FCCLA. And, um, but I noticed that the largest response that said that makes them busy or takes up a lot of their time is there's a lot of homework or schoolwork to do. And that was at about 73.3% of all responses. Uh, question 7B asked, exactly how much time does whatever you applied uh, or whatever you responded with take up? Uh, most people said that it takes around two hours or in between one and three. But a common answer was most of their entire day because many people I saw describe because it was an essay question so you could type as much as you wanted. And many, many people describe their entire schedule and almost the whole thing is packed, especially high schoolers with uh, work. I know uh, one high schooler said that uh, their work could take about six hours a day. So if you have six hours of work and then you need eight hours of sleep, that's 14 hours out of your day already gone. And then, oh, I'm sorry. Six hours of work, about eight hours of sleep to stay healthy, and then eight hours of school. So that's, oh, uh, what is the math? Yeah, that's a lot of that's a lot of hours out of your day taken up, and not a lot left to both take care of your family, or get your schoolwork done, or even just have downtime for yourself and for your mental health. So basically just a lot don't have a lot of free time. Uh, one specific response said chores and then I go to work for five to six hours. Then I try to do my homework before bed, but sometimes I'm so tired I don't even bother. Another response said chores are usually random. For example, cleaning the whole house can take an hour, but around 6.30 I need to start cleaning again because people made a mess. I can spend, I can spend 45 minutes to three hours doing my homework. It all just depends on what it is and when it's due. On average, I spend two to three hours practicing my instrument. So like I said, that's just one of the many responses of people laying out their entire schedule. And as you can see, it's pretty packed on a daily basis. Okay, uh, survey just asked one last question. Anything else that you wanted to add or that we wanted to know? And uh, a lot of people just said no, but uh, there are also a lot of responses that said, like I said before, too much homework or too many assignments. Many, many people uh, have troubles at home or with their mental health. Um, as I've noticed, and as you all saw from the statistics, most people don't see mental health professionals, but many should. And one response I remember reading it even specifically stated that they don't see a professional, but they know that they need to, and they want to see a therapist, but yet they don't. Um, not all stress is school related, but school is a very big factor in it. Um, it's very easy to get caught, uh, get behind, but it's hard to get caught up. It's uh, like Gilbertson mentioned earlier, kind of getting into that hole, digging that hole, and then not being able to dig your way out. Um, most people are very often tired. Uh, one person asked, I think this is my response actually, why is Gen Z struggling with mental health so much? Or why do you see such an increase 
and mental health issues in younger generations, which is something I'd probably like to research more in the future. Um, schools are generally too focused on grades. Like I said, it's that quantity over quality mentality that I would like to get flipped around to quality over quantity. Um, many people have form, uh, poor mental health, which causes physical symptoms to manifest. And lots of high schoolers said that the ACT was stressful. And as I mentioned earlier, that standardized testing can be very stressful. Um, one response I wanted to put on here said, I do the survey, but it's not like it will change anything. These surveys you guys send out never change anything, which I think made me cry when I read it because I was so happy to see that people were actually noticing like, oh my gosh, you know, the school cares, there's a mental health survey, they're checking up on us and that made them really happy. But it made me really sad to see that someone just doesn't even have any hope at all. And I really wanna change that because I know this started out as just a, like I said, a project I wanted to get an A on in my foundations class, but I really do want this to go somewhere now. And I really do want it to make a difference. And I can tell that the students do too. Okay, so just a random question. So this is why. Um, like I said, uh, this started as a project between me and uh, my partner, Abigail. And so we had asked, why are we doing this? So we noticed that we were struggling ourselves with mental health. And we noticed that others our age were struggling with mental health. And that's when we got the idea to do this for a project. And as well as take it further to present to the principals and now the school board. Um, being in the pathway of counseling and mental health, we want to become mental health professionals. So improving mental health of others is what we aspire to do in our lives. Um, we also wanted to spread awareness about student mental health. And then, like, as I said before, we wanted to improve in the classroom. So yes, we know we have school counselors and psychologists, and we are very, very grateful that we have those amazing resources, but sometimes they're not always there, or sometimes we don't even know that we're struggling, or if we do, we don't know how to speak out about it, or if we should, and people are too scared to, or they don't know how to. So it would be awesome to improve in, not like, not just resources, but in the classroom itself. And then this is uh, what Gilbertson mentioned earlier with the open discussion. So these are just anything that you guys want to ask or talk about for either me or Gilbertson. Uh, we're open to anything. All right. Does anybody have? Well, first of all, thank you, Jade. That was an amazing presentation. We really appreciate your time and effort on that and, and for taking the time to come tonight to share that with us. It's, while it's not easy to hear, we need to hear it. So, any questions that anybody has? Mr. Helensky. Um, I got two questions, actually. First one's for uh, Mr. Gilbert. Um, I noticed in that pie that you guys had, that section that was labeled other was really, really big. Um, and when you put something like that on a survey, sometimes people just, well, I don't fit in any of those, and so I'm just going to click other. Do you know the other reasons and where they might fall in that, in that pie graph? Yeah, thank you very much. We we um, allowed students to have a drop down menu of choices and also a comment field where they could fill in, um, you know, whatever they maybe they had an issue with their their bicycle or you know I'm just using that hypothetically. We we needed to lump those together so to make that uh pie graph a little more comprehensible for for presentation purposes we put the other in that that large category there okay and then uh jade question for you for, first of all i couldn't do that type of work as a senior in high school so congratulations to you uh very very thorough um do you feel something like study hall or maybe a mental break during the day sometimes would help some of this or what are some of the ideas that you might have to help get ahead of these problems um, I mean, yeah, I would personally definitely love that. And I know a lot of my friends and peers would too. Um, one idea that popped into my head, I think the last time I presented about this, so it's been a while, but uh, I think one idea that popped into my head was that if we get some sort of um, like a lifestyle class, I'm not sure what you call it. I think Gish used to have one. If not, I know of other schools that have had one. It's basically to teach you... Um, kind of those soft skills, you know, those, those soft skills versus hard skills. Hard skills are things like um, knowing how to fix a computer or, you know, things, something, something like that. Things that the uh, 
a lot of the pathways and academies are teaching, but uh, one of the uh, some sort of lifestyle or life class like that that would just teach simple soft skills like communication and like the importance of mental health or um, how to budget and finance or just like preparing you for uh, college. Well, I mean, Gish already does a pretty good job of that. Uh, preparing you for life, just something, uh, some sort of class like that. But yes, uh, the idea that you mentioned is also very good. All right, thank you. Mr. Bartley. That's okay, I'll get to her. <laughs> All good. Um, so, so in the survey, did you also put in a place for the respondent, uh, this is for Jade, by the way, did you also put a, a place for the respondents to suggest ideas as well? Because I'm sure that there's a lot of good ideas there. Um, no, okay, I, I wish I had done that. I thought about it after I had the survey sent out and all the responses back and I closed the, the responses. I wish I had, but I did not put a question for that, but that's, I think that's what I was trying to go for with the um, anything else question. Is this anything that people wanted to add or felt that, that should be heard? Uh, thank you so much. And thank you so much for doing this work. I mean, it, it is really, really necessary for us to get to know this. So thank you. Yeah, of course. All right. Mrs. Albers. So Jade came to L for L on a Zoom meeting and, and we heard this and were absolutely blown away by her presentation and thought that she needed to come to the board uh, to present this. And um, you know, it's important to keep in mind this isn't a GIPS problem. This is a systemic countrywide issue. Kids are having issues with mental health now. And I went to a conference program once on um, on grading, like different ways to think about grading. And you know, uh, I had high expectations for my kids, and I'll be the first one to say I was very hard on them, still am hard on them. And um, but one one of the things that that this gentleman said was he gave us a list of grades. I'll say so a, a kid got this and this and this and this, and then he said, "What grade would you give this person?" And there were probably 40 people in that room and there were 40 different answers. And so the incon I think sometimes the inconsistency, uh, so the kids don't know how to prepare or how to plan or what's gonna happen if I present this. And, and you know, when you dig that hole and you can't get out of it, I've been that hopeless before. I have been that helpless before. It's very difficult to pull yourself up from that. And so we really, I think, have to look at um, just a, not, it's not one fix. It's not just grades. It's going to fix it for some kids with grades, but I don't know what it's going to fix. You know, somebody else is going to need different supports. So we really have to, we really have to meet the kids where they are. I'm, I'm, this is a huge passion of mine. And um, I think my next soapbox, as you can probably tell. And so but I, I do think that we need to, I think GIPS needs to lead the call on this. I think we really need to find out what our kids need. We need to turn to the students like Jade and, um, and like Kendall. Kendall and I had a conversation about mental health and about his schedule. And I mean, he doesn't get home till 10 o'clock. Sometimes he hasn't popped a book yet. And then how is he supposed to get his eight hours of sleep? Um, and and he's obviously involved because he's sitting here tonight. <laughs> so <laughs> I just, I think, uh, so Jade, this might, well, might throw this to you and maybe with Kendall too, but I do think, so no, I don't have a question. Sorry, I just had a soapbox moment. But I do, I, I do think we need to turn to you guys and, and, and look at what the students need. And, and like you said, you wish you would have asked that. I mean, is there a chance that you would consider doing a follow-up survey and to see what kind of, services kids do need you know um some kids do need mental health some kids do need a grocery voucher some kids do need so we just have to kind of we need we can't help if we don't know what the needs are so what do you think about that jade i definitely yeah, agree there's my with question. you and that's one thing i forgot to mention when i was presenting i got a little nervous and uh, choked up so that's one thing i did want to mention is uh i kind of poked a little bit at it with the, the teachers that every person is unique and every person is individual and everyone has their own specific problems that need to be tailored to, which makes us a little bit of a tricky 
issue to deal with. And again, it is not a GIPS only problem in the slightest. It is a problem nationwide, maybe even worldwide, depending on the country. So I 100% agree with that. And I would love to do another survey and continue this uh, little project uh, asking the students what they think they need for their mental health and for their school. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I would just, I guess, from a Board of Education standpoint, we know, Mr. Gilbertson, you and your team are looking at both the, uh, the chronic absenteeism and then also this issue Jade shared with us uh, and just let us know as a Board of Education what we can do to help what resources you may need, what uh, what changes in policy or whatever it may be. We look forward to working with everyone to make some improvements in this area. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, thank you. We, we Again, we appreciate your time tonight. All right, we will move on to agenda item 7.5, the EAB contract, Mr. Harden. And EAB is the Education Advisory Board. Formally. For, oh, formally. We're just EAB now. Uh, so uh, there you go. So uh, EAB is a uh, research, uh, basically, firm uh, with, uh, you can read the, the description. It's pretty, pretty accurate because it's right from the website. Uh, so um, we've been using EAB for three years, and so... Uh, the current school year will be year three of three. It's our first contract. And so this contract that's in front of you now for your consideration as an informational item is simply a, a renewal for the next three years. Uh, and so some of the things that I'm aware of that we've used EAB for, certainly a, a large part of our social emotional work that we've done has been based out of the EAB's research. I know um, for the strate strategic plan for facilities is the first thing I entered in was a research study for the, from them on um, a master facility planning. And so they were the impetus for where we landed with that. And so there's a number of, I'm sure my colleagues could give you a list, uh, but those are the ones I'm most familiar with. So the nice thing about it is they are um, available 24 seven, you can put in, go to the website and put in what you need and they can respond. There's uh, development uh, um, events uh, and top of mind things that they research and reach out to superintendents across the nation uh, to find out what are the struggles and what are the commonalities. So then a lot of times when we're coming up with things that we're worried about, it's the same kind of thing that some other districts were about across the nation. And so they already have the answers. They've already done the research. They're not waiting for the questions to come to them. They're actively seeking them out. So um, we, we talked about this in cabinet. We talked about it in FNF committee and um, wanted to bring this for your consideration. So with that, I would conclude my comments. Okay, does anybody have any questions or comments? And I assume this will come back to us for approval next month? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. All right. So you will continue with the 7.6, which is the Drawdown Loan Agreement Medical Pathways Academy. All righty. So since Carlos is on the screen, I'm not sure are we able to project the um, budget for the the document maybe you can all just access it let me grab my computer so i have it in front of me can i uh maybe i can join the zoom meeting or would that and then share or not okay okay feel free to bump me i can listen so um, yeah, the, the document that I'm referring to is the master planning tool document. I can't see it. So for board members, we can go ahead and pull this up. And then I guess for community members who might be watching, it is, accessible it is yeah, it's online. So you can find it there. So, so um, this document is the layout of how we kind of approach all projects that we're doing that are a major project. Uh, where we look at the sources of revenue that will pay for it and the uses. And so to give you um, 
a very quick 60,000 foot level. Uh, the idea or concept of a medical science pathway, the eighth floor at uh, CHI St. Francis here in Grand Island is available. It's an empty shell space. And so uh, we've been talking to them for quite a while about the concept of remodeling that space um, for uh, medical pathways. Uh, so it would move the medical pathways from senior high to this location. Well, obviously, an empty shell is not going to work, so we have to do what we'll call leasehold improvements. So this is the leasehold improvements because we wouldn't own the property. The CHI folks own the property. Uh, they originally, um, well, there's a, be a very low-cost lease. We don't know if it'll be 10 or 15 years, but it'll be like a dollar a year kind of lease kind of thing. So um, we have, like I said, been working with them for uh, quite a while, and uh, the CARES Act came up, and part of the CARES Act was some economic development money. E economic Development CARES Act application was made, and they were awarded a pre-grant award notice, basically says, okay, you have some more steps to do uh, before we'll actually sign on the black line or ink, uh, and... Um, commit the federal government's money. So they have $1.75 million of a roughly a $5.9 million project of federal government money that we're talking about. To access that, we have to have the dollars, the remaining balance of those dollars between the 1.75 and the 5.92 um, in the bank basically are ready to be in the bank, cash equivalent is the phrase I will use, for the duration of the project. That's their term, that's what they say. So um, in working with uh, the community, uh, we, uh, as you know, have received a $500,000 donation from JBS Swift for that purpose. That donation is in the hands of the folks at St. Francis and their foundation. And so that's money in the bank, right? So the Grand Island, Senior, or Grand Island Public Schools, uh, we have been, of course, working on our special building fund and have a one cent levy, and we have a million dollars in that fund that we can commit to this project. So, um, you know, you put all that together, and you have about um, $2.675 million that you have left. And so, uh, to unlock that $1.75 million in a timeline, our timeline originally when they got the pre grant award was December 17th. Obviously, we couldn't meet that date, and we told them that. We asked for an extension and have been given a one-time extension until uh, March 18th. By March 18th, we need to have the project of what they basically call shovel-ready. It needs to be in production and happening. So the money has to be there for them to, to get to that point. So uh, we are confident. Uh, I don't know if Tracy's here. So she's going to talk about her confidence level because that's her... Uh, slice of the pie so what i'll tell you my slice of the pie is in working with tracy uh we met with michael rogers I, hopefully that's a name you know uh, that's a bond legal counsel so he does all of the legal opinions for all of our debt and um he brought to us the concept of this drawdown loan agreement and um we would enter into that for a one-year period of duration because that is the statutory authority we have uh, nothing says you can't renew that one-year loan agreement if you would need to. Uh, for that dollar amount, possibly less, just depends on where we're at when we would come back to you. The idea is we're bringing this to you, um, I guess, to kind of put it, put it on, on the floor now. The thing that we're hoping to come away from after we have our dialogue here today is some kind of consensus from the board for administration to move forward and talking with the local bank seeing if they're interested in helping us out with this drawdown loan agreement, and then coming back to you in February uh, for approval of that agreement, then presenting that to the federal government to unlock those funds and have the program happen. Uh, now you would say, well, are we really wanting to borrow uh, $2.6 million? The answer is no. We have uh, no intention of actually drawing down money against the loan. Well, how does that work? Well, what it does is we're bridging the gap between the time we believe it'll take us to raise those funds from 
uh, entities across the state that would be interested in helping us with this project. And uh, the timeline that's just so quick, you know, um, March 18th is pretty, not that far away. Think about a year ago and how quick the COVID started, you know, it, it boom, is right there, right? So I'm gonna stop with my comments there. If you have questions, I'd be happy to take some. Uh, I'd rather have Tracy come up and kind of talk about what's this fundraising piece that's gonna fill in the dollars so we don't have to borrow any money, right? Okay, so Tracy. Um, good evening. It's nice to be here. Um, so uh, this fundraising piece, the, the idea is that we're buying time, right? Um, so that we can put our ducks in a row and get out there and fundraise. And um, this opportunity of having that $1.75 million makes the project happen and happen now and for our kids. So that's the exciting part. Um, in order to effectively fundraise, um, really, you have to have about half in the bank or half, half already committed before you really get out there and have other people want to jump in. And so, um, so this gives us that piece, that 1.75 plus the, the 500,000 that we've already uh, brought in and JBS was so forward thinking and jumping in first. Um, so those two pieces plus are already our commitment to it. Um, gives us the opportunity to have a very strong case that this is going to happen. People want to jump in when it's ready to happen. Um, we have been working with uh, the foundation, the Exarban Foundation, um, the CHI St. Francis Foundation, and the CCC Foundation. So the four of us are teaming up to get out there and make all of those contacts. Um, we've had a lot of positivity around the project so far. Um, and um, even some of them are saying, go ahead and skip that first part, just jump into the grant process. Um, so it feels, it feels pretty good. Um, I have a high confidence that this is the kind of project that um, is exciting for a lot of people and it's gonna do a lot for Grand Island. Um, so we're making all those, starting to make all those contacts now. Um, what we needed to, is to absolutely get that grant solidified. Um, and just even, even given that three month time frame, um, it's, it is um, unrealistic to have uh, more than a few pledges in that time frame. Um, and, and that's not money in the bank, that's pledges. Um, I do feel like the, the organizations that we are talking to and that we've been cultivating um, are organizations that will be able to fund those grants within, within you know, the 12-month period. They're, they're, they're very fluid organizations. Um, so um, I, I don't anticipate there being a, long, a, like a drawn-out pledge period where we would have to to worry about a, a lot of the funds. Um, there's certainly, you know, certainly that scenario out there that, you know, there might be a few donors that need more than one year. But I, I mean, I'm just really excited about the project. Um, I'm excited to be able to start um, getting out there and raising some funds. We've had a, um, a couple of good talks um, with some of our community folks. And um, as we're getting more organized, you know, it kind of took us by surprise too. So <laughs> as we're getting more organized, um, we're kind of getting our ducks in a row um, to be able to really make a real solid case. So um, I'm happy to answer questions on that. Okay. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Mr. Brown. Um, well, just a report. Yeah, we did talk about this quite a bit in facility finance. And I guess when I look back over a, a lot of different projects, we, we as a board and as a district have taken a leap of faith with a lot of different projects. Um, this just is a f officially filling that gap in, but we've kind of fid filled in that time of gap before um, and more of a leap of faith in this. So I really like the way this kind of feels because there is a lot of momentum going. And you just think about the healthcare industry right now they're going to need our kids <laughs> uh, to be filling in positions because um, COVID-19 is going to put a mark on our health care for a long time. And so what a great time to come in with a medical pathway 
located on an eighth, eighth floor of a hospital um, that is just, I can't, this is just the right thing to do. Um, I think about the federal government and the way that they do their funding. And yes, shovel ready is the term I've seen too many times. I work in the transportation industry and that they want projects that are designed, ready to go. And you're like, we don't have those. So you have to figure out a way of making it work. And this is the way we're going to make this work. So again, this is a great opportunity to, um, you call, we call it leap of faith. It's just officially filling in, uh, filling in the blank, hold it, wait, a, a placeholder, so to speak, until we find those, th those funds and they will be here. I, I'm really confident that that this will work. So just my two cents. Well, good. Thank you. Dr. Bros. And one of the things we also talked about in finance and facilities is that some of the people you're talking to, the entities, are give, talking six figures, not $100 here and $100 oh, there. right. Yeah. Good and, point. And the other <laughs> thing I'd like to just point out is that it was recently announced that there's a nursing program leaving one of our neighboring communities and coming into Grand Island. And do you see that as being uh, anything that's going to help this project? Um, that would be a programming question that I am not. Uh... <laughs> well, I realize we're not doing nursing, but it would just seem to me that with a nursing school or a program yeah. coming to Grand Island, it's, it's just right. <laughs> it's just one more uh, step for the kids once they leave the medical pathway. If they should choose to do nursing, they can stay in Grand Island and do that. So... It's just a thought I had after we had the, the finance and facilities meeting. To respond to that, what we heard from our friends at Economic Development is that their goal is to make Grand Island the healthcare hub of the prairie. And so um, they're really jazzed about this project um, because that is that really fits into to their overall idea. Okay. Well, thank you for all the work you're doing, and it's really uh, – Heartwarming, I guess, to hear that all the foundations that are working together, we just let them know that we all very, very much appreciate it. Yes. So it's exciting you. to work with such a, you know, a powerhouse group, right? Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. So uh, good luck. And thank, again, thank you. And I guess to the board members, if you have concerns about this or if you need more information, be sure to let us know. Otherwise, again, next month, expect to see an action item um, for that bridge loan. So. All right, thank you. Okay, 7.7 .7 is the, ne oh, sorry, I jumped here. 7.7 .7 is the Nebraska Children and Families Grant contract, Mrs. Worthington. Good evening. This is on your agenda tonight for information and action. This is money coming to us. That's always fun to report as opposed to the opposite. Um, we have a longstanding relationship with Nebraska Children and Families Foundation. This is through their Beyond School Bells program. They started um, our first makerspace, our TMC lab that's gained so much momentum in our district. So this is um, for expanding learning opportunities. Everything they do is for before and after school and summertime. And you can see this grant runs for this school year through June 30th, although we believe it will be extended just because of COVID. Um, all the districts involved in this grant you know, are spending it maybe a little more slowly than anticipated. It's $155,000 total. And you can see I'm um, on the bottom of page one and continuing after that, it's broken into three pots of money. And I'll explain those then on the next page, but it's $30,000 for one section, $50,000 and $75,000. And half of that will be paid to us as soon as we approve it. And then the other half at the end of the work. So then if you go on to page three, that explains those three pots of money. The $30,000 is, is to continue our Think, Make, Create, our makerspace program. And the only caveat there is that we will help train other school districts. You can see that on number four um, to do makerspace. And we've done that in the past. Jason Wiesman has done that, and he's very comfortable doing it again. B, we've already done quite a bit of that. We actually started this grant in August, um, or actually probably July, just now getting the paperwork done. But our Jumpstart 6 is our transition program from 5th to 6th grade, which we know is a time when students sometimes struggle. And then Thriving Minds provided some experiential opportunities for students during the summertime. And then the biggest part of the grant is the newest part of the grant as well is C, $75,000 for the ELO Innovation Network Incubator. And we're gonna to continue to call that Thriving Minds. Um, we will hire 
three to four coordinators um, after, in addition to their teaching contracts. So these won't be new employees, these will be current employees who will do two things. They'll put together virtual opportunities for our students um, that we can even continue beyond COVID. This is an opportunity for us and Beyond School Bell certainly feels to use this to, to develop some of these engaging activities that can continue virtually into the future. And then to really um, firm up some partnerships with other Nebraska Children and Families Foundation organizations. They have some great organizations, great curriculum, and these coordinators will be much better to decide which ones are gonna work best, like in which schools, which grade levels, they can do that much better than I can. So I'm very excited about that part of it. Um, this is a very easy organization to work with. Their contracts are extremely lengthy, <laughs> as you can see. So if you have questions, um, as you get to the back, it's just the budget for each of the programs. Um, I've gone through this. I don't have any concerns. It's a similar contract that we've signed with them before. So are there any questions that I can answer? Okay, any questions? Nope, it's always good when it's bringing money to us. All right. So thank you. All right, 7.8 is the construction update, Mr. Petch. Oh, and just everyone, can you check to make sure your mics are turned off and even those around you um, where no one is sitting? Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks and uh, congratulations, President Hinkle and Vice President Albers. Uh, I'll report off of uh, what we did at the ELC later on this week. Had a construction meeting, uh, had uh, Amy Richards out there and she's extremely happy with the space. And uh, uh, it was a lot of fun to see her. Her eyes just were lit up. Uh, they're still uh, framing walls and, and uh, finishing off the uh, storm shelter uh, uh, construction on that. They, uh, you know, doing everything from the duct work and electrical and fire protection rough end. So everything's going pretty well. In fact, they were setting the uh, rooftop units uh, the day that we were there. Good thing it wasn't today, because that would have been <laughs> would have been bad. So, um, but uh, yeah, we're we're moving along real, real well. And uh, also, just on the uh, needlepoint bipolar ionization project is is continuing to progress. We've got 13 buildings complete now. Um, all of our secondary buildings would be included in that. We've been uh, working on the elementaries, and so we'll continue to move forward. Uh, with that, so it's, it's all good. With that, I'll uh, conclude my report and I'll answer any questions you might have. All right, does anybody have any questions? No, nope. all right, thank you. Thanks. All right, 7.9 is our student representative report, Mr. Bartling. Thank you, um, and just really quickly, um, welcome and thank you so much to our new board members. Really delighted to have you here and looking forward to working together with you guys. Um, and also, words can't describe how happy I am to be back here. Um, last meeting, it was kind of crazy. It was literally the night before I got the call, and it was a whole bunch of stuff. So it's really great to be back. Um, in terms of athletics, uh, we've made it to the middle of January with sports. Um, not a lot to note between last meeting and this meeting. Um, this Saturday is, the, is conference wrestling in Kearney. Colby Lukasiewicz earned his 100th win last weekend at a tournament. We'll have another wrestler going for his 100th win, that's Blake Cushing. Winning 100 matches in your high school career, uh, career is quite the accomplishment, uh, especially in wrestling. Um, and you know, basketball continues on for both boys and girls, varsity and JVs, and spectators on both teams, which is really, really nice to have. Activities has some really exciting news. Um, the Varsity Show Choir will be traveling, per all applicable guidelines, to compete in Gretna this Saturday. Um, there's some concern as to whether or not that was going to happen, but there's really, really good, uh, good positivity, excitement, and anticipation as we get ready to compete this season, which is really, really nice to have. Um, and band and choir have also gotten the go-ahead to hold concerts with limited audiences um, in person, which is really, really nice to have as well. Um, they're not the same as they were in the past, but it's still really, really nice to have. Um, we'll actually be having a reimagined band day in February where we're going to be bringing clinicians to us instead of going out to clinics. Um, and we'll be able to get, get together, come together, and practice and celebrate music. Um, you know, normally we do an all-city band. It's not possible this year, but we're still able to get that same experience for our students, which is really good. Um, and a quick update from the Unity Council. Um, we met again a couple times in between the last meeting and now. Um, we've successfully started our story collection process that we mentioned last time. 
getting the stories of students and staff members at Grand Island Senior High to, um, you know, seek to educate instead of seek to, you know, being proactive instead of reactive um, in terms of inequities and stuff like that. And by con collecting, distributing, and marketing these stories, we hope the group will gain re name recognition. We'll be able to get larger feedback from these groups as to things that need more addressing and things we can work to um, solve in the district and at the school level in terms of inequities between students. And then for my sort of highlight this time, um, it's an academy highlight. Um, my good friend Ray Hansen, he's a, um, he's a senior in the Academy of Engineering and Technology, and this is a really good story. Um, he recently started, I believe it was two months ago, with Hornady's IT department as an intern. Um, through conversations in class with previous interns and with people at Hornady, Ray was able to interview for and get the internship. There he's doing mainly um, help desk tickets, assisting employees with their tech, tech issues, and will be getting more work as time progresses. Now this next line is going to ask like I told him to say something nice, but this is actually his direct quote as to what he liked most about the internship. And it said, I really like the ability to get real world experience in a field that's incredibly near to what I'd want to do for a career. So I definitely think this internship is helping me figure out in advance what I'd like my future to look like. And I think that's pretty much spot on for what we want out of the academy system. Um, and I've spoken to several other students in similar positions and all of them really enjoy the opportunities they've been given. Um, none of these positions were previously available to high school students without serious, you know, wrestling and going through processes that, you know, high school students really don't go through. Um, and, you know, the benefits are already showing. Um, one more last thing, and it's with COVID protocols. Um, upon return to schools, I've noticed this really, really great thing happening. And it's a gradual, slow, but return to what seems normalcy with concerts allowing to be, you know, going back to having concerts, being able to compete, those sports, uh, you know, still going strong. Um, it's super, super promising. And the pandemic is not over by any means, but as we're rounding the corner into the end of my last semester here at the district, and as we're rounding in the last semester of this year, things are looking really, really promising, and it's, it's just a really nice thing to have. And then one last update. It was mentioned a couple meetings ago that I had put in for inauguration tickets. Yeah. Well... Um, due to COVID and the recent events in Washington, D.C., no, no tickets are publicly available. I will not be not attending the 57th inaugural ceremonies for obvious reasons. So, and with that, I, uh, I'm open to any questions that you may have. Well, that's a bummer you don't get to go, but it's the right decision. Yeah. So, But I wish you could. And, yes, I think we're all learning how to live with COVID. But things are, you know, hopes on the horizon. Soon teachers hopefully will be vaccinated and um, – things will just get back to normal. So thank you. I'm glad to hear it. All right. Anybody have any questions for Ms. Bartling? All right. We'll move to 7.10, the superintendent report, Dr. Grover. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, first off, January is National School Board Appreciation Month. So I had a big round of applause for our Board of Education. <laughs> We do want to just take a moment uh, to acknowledge our Board of Education. Um, you know, what a time to be a board member or just to be in public service. I, I think this is probably one of your most challenging years, but we certainly appreciate the leadership, um, all the guidance that you have provided to us. Oftentimes, people, they don't get to see all the hours you spend, all the questions you answer. Um, you're always available for us to help us problem solve. Uh, and to be able to make uh, decisions to help support us through the work. So I definitely want to say thank you on behalf of all of us here uh, in Grand Island Public Schools. We feel pretty lucky. I guess if there's one word to describe um, you all, and that would be united. You continue to be united around our mission of every student, every day, a success. So thank you so much for your clear focus on the work. Um, so next up, we just want to provide a COVID update and probably just in a couple of different sections. Uh, we're happy to be in 2021, too. Uh, it's January, okay, we, so we've gone uh, through the first semester, and we're back um, healthy, and we're continuing to move forward. We remain in our reimagined model uh, with majority of our students on site, and we continue to serve those students that choose to be in virtual school as well. Our main goal when we first got started, as you know, was to keep a healthy workforce to help keep our schools open. And that's really where we are focused um, at this time. So um, one of the next steps that we're taking um, is working with our Central District Health Department 
uh, in regards to our vaccine. And so first off, I'm going to ask Mr. Gearhart to come out and just to give a little bit of update in regards to maybe where some of the data is, how we're thinking about the vaccine. And I'll come up with some additional um, information as to how we are approaching it within Grand Island Public Schools. Well, good evening. Thanks for having me back. A um, little better, better mood this time than it was a month ago. Um, we've been working real closely with our uh, Central District Health Department. We've been working with staff trying to um, formulate a plan to help facilitate the vaccination of those folks on our staff who are wanting to participate in that. So um, before we get into kind of some of those details, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the risk dial. So this was pegged, you know, 3.9, I think, for uh, uh, quite a while. And we're starting to relax a little bit. Um, we're seeing hospitalizations go down. We're seeing the, uh, the positivity rate in the community go down. All of that's uh, been good news. However, if we, uh, we, I always bring a little bit of caution when we talk about it because if we'd have been here uh, at the beginning of the year, we would have been terrified. But because we've gone through these cycles a couple of times, um, we're now kind of in that place where it's a little more comfortable, but we still need to be very vigilant. So um, this shows the daily new case rates. You can see this is off the Central District Health Department for Hall County. Um, you can see how the holidays just before um, Christmas, that Thanksgiving spike that the state went through, the whole Midwest actually, um, if you remember the graphic, um, showing the, the whole U.S. and the counties and their, their rates. We've come down, you can see there's a bit of a bounce from the holiday, certainly not unexpected. Um, but if we look at the next um, screen here, you can see where we are. It does appear turning that corner, um, at least in regards to how Hall County um, is coming back down off of that bounce. So that's just us with new case rates per 100,000 compared to the state. Um, and I could show you compared to your Miami and your Houston and all, of course, they're, they're back in the, uh, the upswing again. So I was speaking with uh, Mr. Hannon from um, the hospital, and one of the things he said was it's pretty, they, they were tracking how it just, it, it seemed to pulse in, uh, into the center of the country and then it pulsed back out. And, and it was pretty obvious now that they're dealing with all the things we were dealing with just a few short weeks ago. So we sent out a, um, a survey to all of our staff um, and our substitutes, and we asked them if there was an opportunity to work with the health department through GIPS to get your vaccine, would you be interested in that? So um, we did ask for a couple different responses, and the primary reason um, we asked, number one, do you want to get it? Number two, do you not want to get it yet, but maybe you want to get it a little later? Number three, I don't want to get it and now, and I don't want to get it later. And then we've already had it. Um, so we had a handful of folks that fell into those, you know, phase one, a um, tier one, tier two, tier three, healthcare workers, um, some counselors and social workers, the health department's been really good about in a situation where maybe they, at the end of the day, and they don't have, uh, they got three, dial, or th three doses left in a vial, they're not going to just waste it. So they partnered with those, um, those further down in the tiers to say, give us a list and we'll call you. And if you can get here in 15 minutes, we'll get you vaccinated. And so they've been doing that and they worked to the point where they got to um, educators and counselors, social workers, and those frontline folks um, in our organization. So uh, that's good news. But what's neat about this um, looks like our pictures on the side are kind of covering it, but 70% of the folks that responded um, the, to the survey said that they did want to participate. So if you combine that with the 4% the that have already had it and you can, uh, the vaccine, and then you consider that, you know, we've had over 6,000 cases in Hall County, that's 10% uh, that's right there. So those are pretty good numbers when you start looking at what it takes to achieve that herd immunity for our community at least in the population that is the adults in Grand Island Public Schools. This just breaks it up. Um, some, some folks were curious, how does it look uh, across uh, the, the different classifications of employees? So um, green lines, obviously, I'd like to get it. 
Um, the, the second line is I, I don't want to get it. The third is maybe later. Um, and going left to right, you've got uh, administrative, certified, classified, and then substitute. So follows the same pattern. Nothing, uh, no huge outliers. We also um, monitored this by school buildings so that we could coordinate with uh, the health department. So that's really it from the survey and the data. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do now is just get the doses, right? Um, the state has, the health department told us that we're getting to the point where it's past the initial phase 1A where they're doing the PPP program through the pharmacies, distributing the vaccines to the uh, long-term care facilities and the workers in those facilities and the residents. And so once that's done, the state will be getting up to 22,000 doses per week and then figuring out how to distribute those through the health departments. So they're anticipating there's gonna be an increase, but so far I think the largest they've seen was the initial dose they got uh, back in mid-December. So we have um, overall, when you look at that 70%, we had 1,400 and some respondents. We're at uh, 1,009 is our magic number of the folks that we surveyed that wanna get the vaccine. And uh, the pandemic team's working through a number of different processes that we can try and do that, um, certainly taking into consideration some of the reactions that have been reported in the clinical trials, as well as in you know real world through the health department. So, are there any questions? Mr. Bartley. Thank you. Um, so this is just a question that popped into my head. Does the district have any plans to require the vaccine for staff? At this point, there is no plan to require that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. That was very good information. Thank you, Mr. Gearhart. And just a couple of other points, uh, kind of maybe uh, hit in the way that, uh, the question that Kendall asked. Um, at this time, uh, we do not know which choice of the vaccine that we're going to receive uh, we've just been trying to confirm our numbers with the Central District Health Department, um, and we have to kind of move pretty quickly. Whenever they call us, they tell us it's ready, and so that's why it's imperative uh, that we have that information um, and that we um, are ready to go uh, whenever they let us know that it's our turn. Um, and so, again, I just want to reiterate that the decision to receive the vaccination is left solely to the individual. Um, we do see this as the next step in our safety uh, protocols. Um, in addition to um, our safety protocols, even as we consider um, the vaccine, we will continue to wear our mask, social distance when possible, um, as well as the hand washing and hygiene protocols. And of course, um, we're excited that we're nearing uh, the finish line almost, or we're pretty close uh, with our needlepoint um, bipolar ionization that Mr. Pesh talked about earlier. So it's just a combination of strategies to help us to continue to, to stay in school and to keep our staff members safe. And so uh, with that being said, uh, we continue to uh, monitor our substitutes um, and our teacher attendance uh, rates. And I'm just going to ask Mr. Steph if he'd come out and give a quick update so uh, you kind of know where those numbers are. Good evening. You know, as mentioned, one of the uh, critical aspects of keeping our kids in school, of course, is having staff in school to, to provide the education. So since uh, August, when we returned to uh, on-site education, we've been watching our um, teacher attendance rate and, of course, our substitute fill rate uh, very, very closely because that was going to be the real metric that we would have to make a decision maybe to go to one of the other models. If you remember back to October, November, when uh, things in Grand Island were really, you know, kind of hot, um, we were looking at about an average of 50 staff every day that were gone, uh, certified staff that were gone every day due to pandemic-related reasons, and we were only filling about 75% of those classrooms with subs. So um, not only did, I, did that impact the students whose classes <clears throat> they didn't have a substitute for, but then you know, it impacted the entire building because we had to make alternative arrangements for those students to go into other classrooms and to work with other teachers. So. Um, as you recall, in, um, right before Thanksgiving then, we took a couple extra days uh, to give uh, staff a chance to um, you know, recover, both uh, I think mentally and physically. And uh, as we you know, thought about the rest of the first semester and then coming back after Christmas break, one of our real concerns was 
the amount of time that people were going to be gone from school, um, you know, being with uh, maybe groups, family members at Thanksgiving, Christmas break, we were really, really concerned about what kind of exposure and then potentially what kind of availability of staff we would have, you know, right after uh, Christmas break was over with. So um, we're now uh, about 14 days past um, New Year's, so you know, everybody that went and did something has had their chance to be exposed and to show symptoms and all those kinds of things. And we're just really thrilled, um, you know, tracking since uh, January 5th, which was the first uh, student day back, um, to today actually, we are averaging a 98% uh, fill rate with subs. And the number of teachers who've been gone due to pandemic related reasons, uh, remember I said it was up around that 50 range, it's been in the low, uh, just above 10. Uh, on a daily basis, and today it was eight. So um, hopefully that continues. We're real excited. Uh, I think a, a number of things, I think, you know, just the protocols that we have in place, people are really starting to understand the importance and the effectiveness. I do think the mask mandate in the community that was uh, put into place has had a tremendous impact uh, as well. But um, we're just, um, you know, real excited that uh, we've got a good solid fill rate. In fact, this 98% the last two weeks is really, you know, what we, uh, what we strive for in, in a normal year. Um, so, you know, we're uh, very optimistic right now. Thank you so much, Mr. Stephan. Just my last uh, comment here. We are um, just very pleased with our staff. They have indeed been persistent um, through all of this, as well as with their response rate uh, to uh, the survey in regards to the vaccine. And I do want to just uh, take a point of privilege and thank uh, the Grand Island Independent uh, for their article on Mr. Gearhart. Uh, he is indeed our star tech and along with so many other people doing great work here in Grand Island Public Schools. So thank you all for recognizing that and giving a spotlight to one of our staff members. Thank you. That concludes my report. Yes, that was very good news. So thank you everyone. All right, we are going to move into the action items. The first one is the 8.1 Hall County Election Office General Election held November 3rd, 2020. So we receive, or I receive a certified letter from the Hall County election with the official results, which you can open there and see. And we've not done this in the past, but um, in consultation with the election commissioner, they do recommend that we just accept this, much like we accept like the audit report and whatever. So we're not really voting to approve it, we're just accepting it. Um, so I would entertain a motion for that. Mr. Dr. Bros. I move that the board accept the Hall County Commissioner's ele uh, general election votes from the general election that was held on November 3rd, uh, 2020. And is there a second? Second. Second, Mrs. Albers. Any discussion? If not, please vote. Okay, motion passes. <laughs> He's got somebody working for him. <laughs> All right. 8.2 is in the Nebraska Children and Families Grant Contract. Mrs. Worthington. Just if any questions have come up in the last few minutes, I'd be happy to answer them. Did, did you have a question or was that from the last time? Okay. Okay. I would entertain a motion. Mr. Brown. I would move to approve the Nebraska Clinic or Ch Children and Families Grant contract for $155,000 as presented. And is there a second? Second. Second, Ms. Wolf. Any discussion? If not, please vote. All right, motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, now we will move on to the committee reports. The first one is Finance and Facilities Committee. Mr. Brown. Thank you. I'll be re, re, uh, responding with uh, the meeting minutes from our January 5th meeting. Uh, we heard an update from the Nutrition Services, as usual. Uh, Mrs. Spellman reported that um, they are going to be transitioning into a new software. Um, and I guess I, anytime we have software, it, we, it seems like things run out, we have to find another. So that's what's happening here. Um, we also had a, a steamer up, up at senior high that failed and they were able to get that replaced. Um, and also that, um, just a continuing reminding that all the uh, meals are free till the end of the school year. Again, that's been reported several times. 
get we did get an update from um, Corey on the IT. Um, again, we have a new a new network engineer there, and it's just I think you can see the excitement um, on on Corey's side of what they're able being able to do already. Um, they are creating a handbook um, within the, their his department so that when they do have um, staff change order, that's not quite as hard to get people up to speed. Um, uh, we are also he's also um, um, looking at the Amerisco system, which again that's what we're using through uh, the facility finance and in, in the uh, um, uh, and it's working well. I think it's working well so far, and they're going to hopefully be able to get that to, up and going uh, sooner than than later. Um, did review all the uh, the funds again. We do several funds: depreciation, special building, general fund. Uh, payroll, federal programs, all those um, were reviewed. Uh, we got an update from Mrs. Worthington on, on what we just approved on the uh, grant. Um, did review the, so we have a five-year um, revolving plan for the custodial grounds and vehicles. We started this, I think we're in year four or five. Um, come a long way on this, so basically going through every vehicle, um, piece of equipment, what it's used for, age, when it needs to be replaced. Um, and so um, this year, um, again, COVID has caused a lot of issues, but now all the vehicles were made, so we didn't get all the vehicles. So that kind of put us a year behind in some cases. We also got an update on the Red Cross facility use agreement. Um, the Red Cross uses about six of our buildings for different reasons. Um, and that, that's a lengthy form and whatnot. So it's just, a, again, something that we've revisited. Um, we did also, oh, we're going to be looking at um, the, this, the copier, printer, multi-function uh, devices. We have a multi-year um, agreement and it's going to be up again. So we're going to start that RFP process again. I think we're looking at maybe an April time frame to when it comes back to the board. Uh, we will be selling mini buses, which is uh, something we've been talking about for several years. And so those will be coming up for... Um, sale um, looking like sale for approval again back in that April time frame. Um, we are also looking at the transportation service RFQ, something that we've uh, we do uh, every year, um, and that RFQ um, is going to be coming back to us in either in the May or, or June time frame. Again, that's a five-year contract, but we review it every year, and this is actual renewal of that. We did talk about the drawdown loan agreement for quite some time um, and they had lots of speakers on that. Um, very informative. Uh, we did uh, did get a, a, a CFO transition um, plan uh, from Mrs. Mr. Harden is, is starting that process of looking at um, the transitioning for, for him to be um, vacating and leaving us. Um, and again, I think we'll have an update for that next this, this next um, month. Um, with that, I think we've covered most everything we've covered on there. With that, I would conclude my report. Our next meeting would be Tuesday, February 2nd at 7.30. Thank you. Leading for Learning Committee, Mr. Barsinus. Perfect. And can you hear me okay? Yes, All we can. All right. I have a lot of notes, so hold on. Uh, we met January 5th. Uh, we had an ACT update. Kate Crow provided an overview of the ACT data. Uh, the ACT assessment was offered to 12th grade students because we did have to cancel. Uh, so we have due to COVID. Uh, the data is not state reported on the numbers. 494 students, so the 602 seniors, took advantage of the ACT. Um, students did not have the opportunity to complete the John Baylor course prior to the October 6th administration. The 11th grade cohort is scheduled to take the spring assessment April uh, 6th. Social studies pilot, Dr. Bill gives an update as well as the grade 6 12 social studies pilot. And there's a small task for teachers who will be uh, piloting something and have a voice in the selection of the process. Uh, the selection process will continue and will follow the policy and the curriculum and the handbook process. This pilot will take place the fall of uh, 2021 with selection of resources spring of 2022 and implementation fall of 2022. 
Adric Math and algebra, the Algebra Access Math Team, Dr. Chung, uh, Tomjak and team, their team members uh, gave us an update on the research and the planning for student access of math and algebra. Dr. Berman shared the information about the new instructional resource adoption in current curriculum work and described the course shifts and changes in, in math. Um, we did a little, uh, let's see here, Cl uh, classroom marks shows a lot of overlap between eighth grade math and eighth grade algebra. The level of rigor is uh, similar. And the description of how eighth grade algebra is structured and how it differs from ninth grade course and the rationale for the difference. And we are still, um, they're still working on the algebra standards in order to prepare students for a future high school courses. And we also got a description of the multi-tier system in place to ensure students are prepared for eighth grade math in algebra. <clears throat> the academies have created a, a math sequence for each pathway and have access advisory boards to verify that the students need to be successful in college. Uh, we also received more information on students in career math have access to the math assessment, which is the college entry assessment as well. And some of the next steps are the middle school will continue to strengthen uh, the differentiated supports for learning in a systematic way and provide a role specific professional learning. DISH will expand the use of aligned course documents as students are selecting courses and identify tools to measure self uh, efficacy and in math. Gear Up is uh, supporting here a little bit earlier, eighth and ninth grade math, or eighth and ninth grade, and providing direct support to students that need tutoring and continue to track the data for the students receiving extra time and direct support. Uh, four, four ninth grade teachers will be attending a professional learning opportunity through Stanford University in April. PK 12 task force will focus on vision work, study of best practices, and strengthen the transition. Uh, focus uh, groups will, of students and continue classroom visits will continue to happen. And with Gear Up, UNL, with uh, Dr. Rayleigh, give us the update and describe how UNL continues to provide uh, math services to, uh, to the grant and provide academic enrichment opportunities. And how typically the ninth grade students would have uh, toured UNL, but because of COVID, it was now a virtual uh, setup. And with that, I conclude my report and our next meeting will be February 2nd. All right, thank you very much. For personnel committee, Dr. Bros. Yes. We received a report on COVID vaccinations for, for staff and uh, Mr. Gerhardt updated us with that this evening. <clears throat> Academic return on investment and strategic budgeting update. The committee received an update on the strategic budgeting and <clears throat> academic return on investment project. Administrators were served and identified a list of potential funding priorities which align with the strategic plan and, the equity and their equity commitments. Another professional development se session is scheduled for January 18th to develop more clarity and focus which would include specific investments that would need to be made. The Board of Education will have an opportunity to review this work once the recommendations have been finalized. Uh, we always review on a monthly basis the substitute teacher fill rate, which Mr. Stout reviewed for you this evening. Non-binding certified staff surveys were distributed the, the week of January 11th to begin gathering information about staffing needs for the 21-22 school year. We looked at the staffing report, which we had in the board agenda this evening. There, are no, there were no new vacancies to report. Human Resources is continuing to recruit uh, classified vacancies for paraprofessionals, custodians, crossing guards, and a department secretary. The position of chief financial officer has been posted and advertised for national exposure. Screening of interviews are anticipated to begin next Monday. Uh, staff adjustments uh, were reviewed and accepted as presented. And our next meeting is February 6th at 7 a.m. All right, thank you very much. For policy committee, Mrs. Albers. We met on Monday, January 11th at 4.30 via Zoom. 
and a couple of the policies that we were reviewing. Uh, 9311, donations of collectibles, gifts, grants, and bequests, and 9310, fundraising activities. Dr. Dexter and Tracy Skalberg are working together um, so that those policies align and are consistent throughout the district. And then um, GIPS, uh, Board of Education Needs Analysis, and 1111.1 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, uh, policy equity uh, analysis checklist. You know, we've talked a lot about um, something being equal and something being equitable. And so uh, they're working on a checklist that will kind of allow us to look at these policies and make sure that uh, they do, they are equitable. Um, I think what, one of the things I said in the meeting is that I didn't really feel qualified to make those decisions, and so if they feel like this checklist will allow uh, the district to do that, then um, more power to them, and that's awesome. Um, they're also working on a GISH online learning policy. A team of staff from GISH will come together to work on what um, these different categories mean and how to define them. They're getting a little bit of assistance from uh, NDE and just about how to how to evaluate the classes and kind of what expectations are for online learning. Some policies were um, moved to governance, the board governance committee, 2511 board operating principles, 2215 board membership, 2311 board member vacancies, 3210 qualifications and duties of the superintendent, 3212 superintendent evaluation. And our next meeting is February 8th, uh, 430 via Zoom. Okay, thank you very much. Public Relations and Partnership Development Committee, Mr. Barsonis. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. Even as close as I am to my screen, I need glasses, sorry. All right, so we met on January 8th and we did a quick Usually we start a meeting with what was the beat on the street and what are we hearing uh, in the community. A couple of comments where people are happy the kids are back in school after winter break and hey, we continue to be in school, we've made it this far. Uh, some area schools announced they have extended protocols for uh, sports, sports spectators. Um, Josh shared our department priorities for 2021 and the communications department refined some of the goals and we'll stay on track of those. We did get also an update on the analytics and the social media calendar. Um, we reviewed the social media content, which they keep track of every school, every story uh, in a nice colorful Excel sheet and just to make sure that we're getting the work out there. Uh, communications and engagement plan with staff uh, for vaccine. You guys, uh, we heard a little bit of that. They continue to work on this and we'll keep hearing about it. And if you haven't had a chance, uh, which I hope all you do, the Heartbeat with Dr. Grover episode and series is out there. So make sure you continue to share it. Uh, the last one we had here was highlighting school nurses. And uh, again, if you thought, uh, if you wanna shed a tear and see all the hard work, they're doing a great job just putting this out there. And uh, Josh also gave us a sneak peek to the annual report um, as his first one uh, this year, and we reviewed the information in there, and I think it's uh, it was it was good to see all the things that are happening and uh, how we're tracking all the information. And with that, I conclude my report, and we'll be meeting next Friday, February fifth at eight a.m. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 9.6 is the governance committee and I will be reporting on this um, item. We met twice now to talk about the student representative position and what we can do to uh, enhance it and make it even more meaningful for the student that uh, is the representative as well as for us as the Board of Education. So if you read the notes, there are several suggestions, things that we're going to um, try to implement. Uh, one of them is just getting the information out to kids at senior high to make sure that they understand what it is the student representative uh, position is and how they can apply for it if they want to. And uh, so we will be meeting again as a governance report uh, or committee, sorry, soon. We didn't set another meeting uh, 
that's probably my fault. And so I also want to take this um, opportunity, since we're talking about governance, and apologize to our new board members because I failed to have your family introduce themselves. That's something we always do. And I s saw them out there and I thought about doing it and just didn't. And Erica reminded me. But it's a little too late. So if they ever want to come back at the beginning of the meeting, we can introduce them. But maybe you can just share who is here with you. So Mrs. Jurgens, do you want to share who is with you tonight? Uh, tonight, my husband, Adam Jurgens, was here. And then my three kids, Isaiah Holly, Elijah Holly, and Sela Holly, were here. Okay. And they have no interest in coming back and introducing okay. me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can show a picture around. I, and I am so sorry they didn't get to do that. So, Mr. Holinsky. Uh, that was my wife with me. Uh, my 13-year-old son wanted nothing to do with this. <laughs> and my 15-year-old daughter had show choir rehearsal. Oh, okay. So, she, my wife didn't want to come, but I kind of made her. Okay. Uh, but she was here. She asked if she could leave after I was sworn in. I said yes. Okay. She's very, very shy even though she is a teacher, but she likes to deal with little minds, not big minds, is what she says. So that's who that was with me, was my wife. All right, wife. thank you. And Mr. Holly. Uh, as you probably know, I, Lindsay and I do share three children. So <laughs> uh, my wife, Lisa, was here. My three children, Isaiah, Elijah, and Sela. My son, Josiah, was here. Uh, my nephew, Fallon, who lives with us, was here. And our son, Isaac, couldn't make it tonight. Okay, well, thank you very much. Appreciate that. And like I said, I apologize. So 9.7 is the Grand Island Public Schools Foundation Report, Mrs. Albers. The Foundation Online Scholarship uh, application went live on December 1st. And poor Kendall, I always look at him when I start talking about, like, did you get that done? <laughs> um, uh, and it's, uh, it's due February 10th. And then at their January board meeting, the Foundation Board will induct new board members Audrey Lutz and Casey Hinkey. They're saying goodbye to board members Kirk Ramsey and Jim Jeffries and wish them well and thank them for their service. Um, additionally, the uh, foundation hosted a new board member orientation on January 14th. Uh, the foundation board and strategic planning team will hear the results of their perception survey and consultant recommendations on Thursday, January 7th. The foundation board will then continue to work with the consultants from Match Nonprofit Consulting to develop their strategic plan. Um, the mini grant application has opened and those will be for projects that will benefit students after March, during the spring or summer of 2021, and those requests will be accepted until January 28th. The foundation awards mini grants in two rounds on an annual basis. The grants are designed to fund educational opportunities for students that are not available through the school's, school district's general budget. The foundation is gearing up for a busy spring. The annual staff campaign will begin in March and scholarship review will begin in late February. Anyone who would like to volunteer to be part of the scholarship review is welcome, um, as long as they are not related to a GISH senior this year. Um, and then, uh, one, I just wanna mention that for the new board members, that's really kind of a neat thing to do. Have you done that before? So, um, if you are interested in that, you read the scholarship applications and they, uh, I'll just say they make it dummy proof. I mean, honestly, you can, it's, they really make it easy to do. And I mean, you keep the Kleenexes close by because some of those stories are heart wrenching and they always need people to read those applications. And uh, it's, it just is a kind of a nice way to delve into really what our student population looks like. So I encourage you to do that, if not this year, they need volunteers every year, so you always get a chance to do that. Um, and then after receiving numbers from their audit, the foundation has published their um, an mini annual report. And that concludes my report. All right, thank you very much. So 9.9 .9 is the Nebraska Association of School Boards monthly update, and it's attached for you there. You also get it in an email, but they, we just want to make sure that this gets on our agenda every month to make sure everybody's um, keeping up to date with what they are doing. This one, there's always a quick little video, and this one focused on uh, Colby Coash, who is the handles the legislation piece of it for the association and just talking about how those things are getting off or started, I should say, with the Nebraska legislature. And then Marsha Herring gave some information about new board training that will be available to us. And they're continuing to do stuff uh, virtually online. I think they really want to get 
back to in-person training, uh, but so far not there yet. And I totally skipped 9.8, the GNSA Legislative Committee report, and that's because it's going so well, there's nothing for us to worry about. Nothing to worry about. We're going to go through the first 40 bills. Okay. Oh, just 40. <laughs> just 40. Uh, I think we'll be done by the, you know, about 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. So I am kidding. I do just want to show you the list and highlight a couple things. I promise I won't go through every one because all I did was pull a database off the website. So, but these, this is the first, uh, of course, the bill introductions go through the 10th day of the session, which is next Wednesday. So we have some more fun to look forward to. So this is every bill that uh, has been introduced. It's online at this point that has school or something to do with schools. Uh, you have everything from uh, the bottom where we have a constitutional amendment to require the state of Nebraska to pay for all classroom expenses related to the operation of public elementary and secondary schools. So classrooms, so that would be no you know, anyhow. Uh, so uh, the first GNSA meeting uh, is a Zoom meeting, and it will be next Wednesday. Uh, hopefully you all have that invitation uh, through the GNSA uh, emails that have gone out. If you don't, let me know. Uh, you're more than welcome to be there. But the, generally speaking, it's the members of the Legislative Committee, which will be coming out tomorrow. So I'll, know, I'll email those folks when I get that list. Um, and so the governor did his state of the state address today, and so he has three things that um, he wants us to know about. Uh, fully fund Tiosa. Huh. Well, we might have some feedback for him on that, but uh, we'll just wait until a more appropriate time. Uh, he wants to uh, take the opportunity scholarships and take it to four million dollars. Uh, over the next biennium, so really it's $2 million each of the next two budgets. The state budget goes July 1 to June 30th. So we're talking about July 1 of 21 to June of 22, and then 22, July 22 to June of 23. So then the time frame. And then he wants to take the tax credits, um, and I, I just have to quote him on this because it's just mind-boggling to me. Uh, but um, he wants to take the current $500,000 uh, al allocation, add a $1.5 million to it to make it two, and then have that bound, doubled, you know, because it's each of the two years, so private schools can get more tax dollars. And I quote, and he said that here in Grand Island. So um, the other thing that uh, Dr. Grover and I wanted to make sure we talked about was that the CARES Act 2.0, uh, I think we gave you a little bit of information on that. Um, to say you'll be in a fight to keep that from being not included in a resource and therefore reducing your TIOSA probably is an understatement. Okay. There's already movement afoot, and so that would be devastating because you have very real additional costs that are associated with fighting the coronavirus and all the things that are going on, and for them to simply say, well, you as an equalized district, because you have that, then we'll give you less state aid. Uh, it's a typical move. I'll remind you about the cliff effect. Uh, oh, I don't know, a decade ago uh, now, uh, maybe even 11 years ago, I was in this room and we had a nice, big, packed boardroom full of people when we were cutting, oh, three, three and a half million dollars out of the budget because of the cliff effect from, uh, all the economic turmoil of the housing bubble. So anyhow, um, to say uh, we'll have our hands full with the legislative issues is probably just normal course of business, right? So um, that's what we know at this point in time. So there's a lot of things out there and we'll go from there. So I'll conclude my comments. But we have a new education chair. Mm -hmm. We do. Uh, we have a friend in the chair, and um, as you may or may not know, when a senator goes for a chairmanship and loses, they cannot be on that committee as a matter of the legislature having learned through experience that that's a bad thing to let happen, because yeah. uh, you can imagine the cast that then occurs in committee when you have somebody on that committee that wanted to be chair and didn't get it. 
So they just have that rule, and that's been around for many, many decades. I think it's one of the few rules they don't mess with. So it's a good thing. So Senator Groney is not only not chair, but he is not on the committee. Right. So that helps. Definitely yeah. helps. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Agenda item 10 is executive session for the purpose of negotiations because it is in the best interest of the public to discuss the matter in closed session. Do I have a motion? Mr. Brown. I would move to, for the board.
It is. I, I would agree. Are we all back? All right. All right. Are we going to call Carlos again or not? Or Carlos, are you still on? Okay. Well, um, so I would need a motion to reconvene from executive session. I move re we reconvene from executive session. And is there a second? Second, Mr. Brown, please vote. <laughs> She'll see us all do that. <laughs> I would just have him. I would just have him abstain. Oh, shut him off. Okay. Okay. Oh, he's here. Okay. Ask me if he wants to vote for to. Did you want to vote for reconvening? For reconvening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now, can you do? So the motion. The motion was Dr. Bros, and the second was Mr. Brown. Motion carried. Uh, there is no action that we need to take based on our executive session. Our next board meeting, uh, well, don't forget about the February 6th workshop equity retreat. It will be virtual. Um, and then our next regular board meeting.